Today, we cover the infinitive construct in the Cal stem. Now, if you've memorized your imperative, your Cal imperative, you know the Cal infinitive construct. Look at Catal. The imperative is Catal. The infinitive construct is also Catal. Context will be key. We've said it before, we're saying it again, it's still true. So look at all the different forms across strong and weak. Kathov, to write. Zakor, to remember. Shamor, to keep. Azov, to abandon. Amor, to say. Bachor, to choose. Shiloach, to send. This one has a furtive pathak where the pathak is last, but it's pronounced before the chet. Shemoa, to hear. Karo, to call. Now, it's important to remember that uh, there can be ablaut. There can be variations in the vowels. Nothing changes there. Also, some of the verbs don't always mirror or match their imperative counterpart. But again, we're not aiming for perfect, fluent knowledge. We're aiming for readability. Don't worry about rote memorization here. Simply be able to recognize it. That's it. Now, a special note on third hey verbs. For these weak verbs, there are some variations in the endings. And keep in mind what's going on here is infinitives are verbal nouns. So it's, it should come as no surprise that just as we see with nouns with a third hey, sometimes we see third hey verbs with oath endings. Look at bana to build. In the imperfect, we have yivne. In the imperative, we have bene. In the infinitive construct, we have benoth. So in this example, we see that the hey changes and our holum lengthens to a vav holum. And so we get the oath ending. So look at a few more examples. Bekoth, bekoth, to weep. Aloth, to go up. Anoth, to answer. Asoth, to do. Hayoth, to be. Reoth, to see. Now a note on first noon week verbs. The noon will often drop out. We've seen this before. This is not a new concept. So look at nasa. Sometimes it'll show up as naso a, naso a. Other times it will show up as saath. So you will see some alternate versions, and these verbs can occur in either form. Again, it's not about rote memorization, but about recognition and readability. Look at a few more examples. Naga becomes nigoa or gaath. Nata becomes nisoa or taath. Nasa becomes niso or seeth. Or another alternate form, seeth. Look at nathan. It becomes nathon or teth. Notice in these alternate forms, the accent moves to the front. So it's the first syllable. Similarly to the first noon, we have first yod. And often the first yod drops out. And at the end of the infinitive construct, we add tav. Look at yeshav, for example. It becomes sheveth. Again, the accent moves to the first syllable. Or look at yada. It becomes da'ath. Da'ath. So what happens with first yods can also happen to halak because halak is inflected like first yods. So halak becomes lecheth. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, well, at least I have, We've talked about biconsonantals before and how the lexical version is the infinitive construct. We have three different kinds. We have shirik class, kum. We have yod 
class, sim, and we have holom vav class, bo. These are all infinitive constructs. You know these already since because we've talked about them before. When it comes to recognition, because infinitive constructs may actually be imperatives, you'll need to be able to parse them two different ways. You'll need to be able to parse as an imperative. You'll need to be able to imparse as an infinitive. But we are talking about infinitive constructs this week. Next week, we will look at infinitive absolutes. Which means when you are parsing, you need to be able to tell the difference between a construct form and an absolute form. And therefore, as part of your parsing, you will include, if it is an inf infinitive, whether it's a con construct or an absolute. Now, with these constructs, infinitive constructs, there is no person, number, and gender. There is only stem and conjugation, cal, infinitive, plus you will put whether it's in an absolute or construct. Then you'll put the lexical form and then the inflected meaning. So looking at katal, for example, if we say katol, that could be second masculine singular cal imperative from katal, meaning you kill. It could also be cal infinitive construct from katal to kill. Now, the reason why these are called infinitive constructs is they can be attached to other features of Hebrew, like the pronominal suffix, okay? And so we use the construct form. This is just how nouns work, right? When we attach it to a pronominal suffix, you might not translate it as to with a verbal action like to kill. You might change it into a participle in its translation or what might be known as a like a gerund, okay? Because the object is the pronominal suffix. It receives the action of the verb. So instead of to kill me, you might translate it as killing me, katli, killing me. If you determine by context that the pronominal suffix is actually the subject, then you make it possessive, my killing. As is often the case, and we've said it earlier in this lesson as well, context is king. Context is key. Pay attention to the context. The infinitive construct may also be joined with inseparable prepositions, k, l, b. In general, infinitive construct plus l indicates purpose or result in order that so that something like that but and k are both used temporally that means time such as while or after or when now contextually speaking of all the verbal forms we've learned thus far guess what if you see something that looks like an imperative or an infinitive construct, and you do see ba, ha, or la, you know it's an infinitive construct. You know it. Process of elimination. It is the only one thus far that has the ability to attach itself to ba, ha, or la. Okay? It cannot be the imperative. Now, the infinitive construct can add not only the the prefix bacha or la but also in the same instance add pronominal suffix at the end for example chashamo. now when it comes to negation we do not use lo we do not use all instead we use bilti bilti means not or in order not it is used exclusively with our infinitive construct. Sometimes you'll see it as level T. Either form means the same thing, not or in order not. And it's used with the infinitive construct. Now, the infinitive construct can be quite flexible in its translation. It will pose some considerable difficulty and that's okay. That's what makes translation fun. So get used to it, be comfortable with it. 
Now you can get more information from a, a Hebrew grammar that's very in-depth, like Walt, Waltke O'Connor, for example, Jesenius. But we've got the basics here. First is purpose, uh, intention or result. This is to be translated to, in order to, or so that. One way to help understand or recognize, rather, the, the, the purpose is the use of le. Le will be prefixed. That's almost a dead giveaway that we're dealing with purpose or result. Except when it's inceptive. That's our next category, inceptive. This is the I am about to do something. And it's also prefixed with the le. Context will be key. So this denotes an action that's about to take place. There's the simple verbal noun. It's verbal because it's a verb, but it functions as a noun. And often it won't have any prefix preposition, but it could, including le. Context will be key. There's the complementary infinitive. This is where you add ing, making it look like a gerund, or what I would say a participle. And it may or may not have le. The key to this one is you will also supply the helping translation word by. By walking by living, by dwelling, by. You're gonna add by and then change it to ing. Then there's the temporal, which we've talked about earlier, and this is where you supply the helping translation words while or when or after. The key to understanding the temporal is that there is no time aspect. Remember, we've talked about this. Hebrew, it does not have time built in. So. We can't say past tense. It doesn't even have tense. We have stems. We have conjugations. No tense. So context will help determine the tempor temporal aspect of the infinitive construct. Now there's two aspects in the translation that you might utilize. One is completed action. For example, with uh, to hear. Well, it could be translated when heard or it could be incomplete action, which could be future. It could be when he hears, when she will hear. You're gonna need the context to help determine that. What will help is the presence of b or h, often, but not always, the infinitive construct will also have a pronominal suffix. And you may have the temporal modifier of haya, present, which is to be. Originally, I was going to do a separate video on the infinitive absolute in the Cal stem, but I decided, you know what? Let's add it on to the end of the Cal infinitive construct. Why? Because it is extremely simple. It's also very rare. So there's not a whole lot to have to learn here, and you're hardly ever going to encounter it by comparison to the others. The infinitive absolute much like the construct in the cal stem it has an o class stem vowel but in this case instead of a holum it's a holum vav most of the time but what makes this especially different is the comets in the first syllable so instead of a shiva we have a comet in the first syllable in the second syllable Instead of a holum, we have a holum vav. Now, there is an alternate spelling, which is to retain a holum. But it will still have the comets. So the key to this is understanding the comets plus either a holum or a holum vav. Look at katal. We have in the infinitive absolute Katol, katol. That can be spelled either with a holum or with a holum vav, but either way we have the sound, the pronunciation, katol. Now, for the most part, even weak verbs follow this pattern quite consistently, though not 100%. So a couple of examples, halak becomes haloch, ga'al becomes ga'ol, Shama becomes Shamoa, Yada 
becomes Yadoa. We can even look at geminate. Savav becomes Savov. Now, much like we saw with the infinitive construct, you have to be careful of third het. Look at shakach. The infinitive absolute is shakoach. Now, be mindful that third he can take two different forms. For example, asa can be aso, or it can be aso. The spelling can be different. The pronunciation is the same. One retains the third he and keeps a holum. The other drops the third he and uses holum vav. When it comes to biconsonantals, remember we have three different classes. We have yod class, hol, uh, shirat class, and holum vav class. The infinitive absolute simply replaces the vowel in every instance with holum vav. Now when it comes to bow, which is already a holum vav in the infinitive construct, it could also be infinitive absolute. Now it does also have a defective spelling and that is instead of a holum vav, it could be a holum bow. But otherwise, the other classes, they just switch to holum vav in the infinitive absolute. What sets the infinitive absolute apart from the infinitive co construct is that it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to have any prefixes or suffixes, right? So no b, ch, or la, and no pronominal suffixes. There's a lot of different uses. Again, consult a, a, a more thorough grammar, but the basics are em emphatic. So you'll just add helping words. Indeed, certainly, surely. You'll possibly be looking at an emphatic infinitive absolute when it is either immediately preceded or sometimes followed by a perfect or imperfect, but it has to be the same verbal root. And so it appears that it's doubling. And when you have a doubling, you know it is adding emphasis with the infinitive absolute. There's the imperatival, which is a fancy way of saying command. Yes, infinitive absolute can function as a command, which is to say it's functioning similarly to the imperative. There's the infinitive absolute of contemporaneous action. These combine with a perfect or imperfect verb, and it expresses the idea that the action in the infinitive absolute is happening at the same time as the main verb. Typically, it's going to be verbs of the same root. So instead of emphatic though, depending on the context, you'll need to translate it along the lines of while going as he or she went it'll depend on the context context is key there's also the complementary infinitive absolute what it is doing is complementing the main verb of the sentence and what that means is it will mirror however you're translating the completed action or incompleted action so it functions either as a perfect or an imperfect conjugation. Now let's look at the particles, yesh, as well as ein. Yesh means there is or there are. And this is used to indicate someone or something is present or exists. When yesh is combined with la, it expresses possession. Now, when you translate these, you're going to need to be a little flexible and change things around. If you leave it wooden and word for word, it's going to sound funny. The opposite of yesh is ain. This is the non-existence of someone or something. Ain can also be spelled as ayin. It's translated there is not, there are not. Sometimes, oftentimes, ain will occur with attached pronominal suffixes. The last thing to understand about ain is that, and we're going to get more into this with 
with participles later. When you're dealing with a predicative participle, ain can serve as a negative particle, like lo or all, but it has to be used with a verbless clause or a verbless sentence. In other words, it has to be with a predicative participle where there is no main verb. And that's it. That's infinitive construct. That's infinitive absolute. Which means we have covered Cal infinitives. Next, we're going to learn Cal participles. See you next time.